Amen. Anybody love Jesus today? Come on. It's a fun day. It's a fun time. Amen. Okay, so I'm just going to summarize for you. Last week, we told the Christmas story. Pastor Ricky gave us the Christmas story last week. Was it not awesome? Yes, amen. So if you remember, and some of you guys know the story well, the angel came to Mary and said, you're going to have a baby. And there's going to be no earthly father. It's going to be a miracle. Why is it got to be a miracle like this? Because this is going to be God. It's going to be the Messiah, the son of God in human form, the angel told her. And then Joseph kind of freaks out. Some of you guys know that part of the story. And then he got his own angel. Aren't you glad he got his own angel? Poor guy needed his own angel. And then she went to have the baby and they traveled to Bethlehem because there was a census. And you guys know the story. And they went to the inn and the inn had no room for them. So they ended up in a stable surrounded by farm animals. And the manger, we use the word manger all the time. Most people don't know what that means. That's a feeding trough. And the baby's placed in a feeding trough. And then after the baby's born, all of a sudden, angels appear to the shepherds. Do you remember? And they tell the shepherds, you're going to go find this baby who was sent to mankind and glory to God in the highest. And we don't know if they sang it or if they shouted it. It doesn't matter to us, but they said it. Amen. And then the shepherds ran off. It says they hurried off to Bethlehem because they wanted to see it with their own eyes. And then they found themselves bowing down and literally worshiping a baby in a diaper. I assume it was a diaper. Can you imagine worshiping a baby in a diaper? And they did. And they were amazed at what they saw. And Joseph and Mary are amazed at what they saw. And that's what we celebrate with Silent Night is that moment right there, the silence of that stable, which I don't really know if it was silent. Yes? And then it says, the shepherds went off and they told everybody about these things. Now, this all comes from Luke 2 because Luke, Dr. Luke is the person who wrote down the Christmas story. And this is verse 17. And we're going to continue with this moment with the shepherds. When the shepherds had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. Did you catch that? So all this had happened and Mary treasured all the things that had happened in her heart. Now, why does Dr. Luke tell us that as he writes his gospel? The reason the scriptures tell us is because Dr. Luke probably referenced Mary the person for his account of Christmas. Mary had treasured up all these memories that she had of everything that had happened, all the detail. She had kept them deep in her heart. So I had to look up that Greek word, um, sintereo. Say sintereo. You spoke Greek on Christmas Eve. Sintereo. That's the word for treasured. Mary sintereo. She she sintereo these memories. It means that she protected them. Sintereo is when something might decay and you decide to protect it so that it won't decay. And so she preserved and she protected the memories. This mama's heart refused to let any of this stuff go. Even after Jesus eventually was killed on a cross, Mary finds herself sitting down with Dr. Luke and recounting everything. How do we know about the shepherds today and the angels that sang to the shepherds? We know about it because Mary told Dr. Luke about it. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, guiding her, helping her to remember details. Maybe she did forget, but she's the one who treasured them in her heart. And I love that Luke tells us that. Treasuring up in your heart, refusing to forget. Being a pastor here in Lawton, Oklahoma, near Fort Sill, I've gotten to know a lot of soldiers. And one of the things I've gotten to see that I'd never seen before is soldiers who have friends that maybe died in the line of duty. And those soldiers who had that friend They dedicate themselves to remembering that friend. And you'll see it on social media and 
and I'll have conversations and they'll bring it up in conversations. They're going to remember that day. They're going to remember that person and they're not going to let go of the memory of that person. What are they going to do? They're going to, for the sake of honor, they're going to keep it alive. And often they're supportive to the family that's been left behind. And I've seen this practice in our soldiers. Have you seen this? And they dedicate themselves, and it's important. And when they do that, what are they really doing? They're refusing to move on. And I don't mean that we should stay in grief and in an unhealthy place where we don't heal. I don't mean that. But sometimes this cruel world gets so busy that it's all about moving on to the next thing. And when we just move on to the next thing, we have a way of making the other thing not matter and making it small. And what do soldiers do? Soldiers refuse to let it be small and to let those people be small. And Mary understood this special love and the priority. Maybe you find yourself in this story today. And I've got a slide for you here. Like Mary, you deeply protect and you preserve the memories that matter. Maybe you see yourself in her. See, one of the things about the Christmas story specifically, which is not a story, it's a historical account, amen? But one of the things about the Christmas account that's important is that it shows us who God is. It shows us about God. But number two, it gives us an opportunity to see ourselves in the story. And when you don't let the story just go past you, but instead you find yourself in the biblical story, something wonderful happens in your life. You start to connect with the scripture. And so I'm going to give you four opportunities today to see yourself in the story. And this is the very first one that maybe like Mary, you've got something in your personality, your background, your experience, where you value preserving Sintereo those memories and those people. That's some of us. All right, let's move on to the next one. Verse 22. When the time came for the purification rites that are required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As, is it, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated. That means set aside for special use. Set aside for God is what he's doing. And to offer the sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. This is a baby dedication of Jesus. Some of you guys have had your own babies dedicated. I think it's a good thing, amen? I think it's a good thing to, to stop at the very beginning of a child's life and to say, we're dedicated as a family, as, as, as parents, to raise them in the way of Jesus. And that's what Mary and Joseph are doing here is they're, they're following the law, yes, but they're, they're taking a moment. And notice they're traveling specifically to Jerusalem. This is important to them. They're going to the capital, to the temple to do this. And they offer two doves. Now, why is that important? Because in Leviticus chapter 12, this little moment is described in the law. And when you go to dedicate a baby in Jewish law, you're supposed to bring a lamb you're supposed to bring a lamb, and the lamb is sacrificed as you dedicate this child. But there's a special provision made because lambs are expensive. There's a special provision made that says, but you could bring, if you're poor, two doves because they're cheaper. So what does the scripture show us here about Mary and Joseph and their family? They're poor. So Jesus when he chose of all the families to be born into, he was born into a poor family. And that means Jesus understands poor people. And he understands people who are marginalized. Amen? He made a conscious choice to do that. I mean, Jesus, Jesus had hand-me-downs. Amen? He had the generic Rice Krispies. Amen? Amen? Some days he didn't even get the generic Rice Krispies, probably. He grew up in that kind of family. And some of you guys grew up in that kind of family. Does it matter to you today that Jesus understands not just the information, he understands what it feels like? Because he grew up in a family like that. Some of you guys struggle to pay your bills today. And Jesus gets you. 
Now this, as a baby, this is the very first time that Jesus visits the Jerusalem temple. And his family's going to visit every single year. And then uh, many of you know that's where Jesus, Jesus will eventually die in Jerusalem. But he's going to be in the temple a lot. There's a lot that I could tell you about Jesus' many visits to the temple. But I'll just tell you this, that when Jesus eventually became a man and he started his adult ministry, there was one particular moment that he went into the temple and he saw some money changers there. Do you remember this story? Jesus saw money changers there, and specifically he saw people, the scripture says, that were selling doves. And Jesus made a whip, and he turned over the tables, and he drove them out in righteous anger. And again, some of you know that story, and some of you that story has always felt weird to you. Like, why did Jesus all of a sudden lose it? Over money changers in the temple, and here's why. Scholars tell us that before that moment, the high priest and the Sadducees had started a special market inside the temple. How dare they do this inside the temple? And they were selling doves and they were selling them at a mega oh, price increase. You know, sometimes you go to the, um, you go to like an airport and they're going to charge you a lot for that candy bar. Amen. Because you're paying for the convenience that it's right there. And so Annas, the high priest at that time, had decided that if we can sell doves to people for the sacrifice right there in the temple, we can do quite the markup to them. And what they were doing is they were being greedy religious leaders who were stealing from poor people. And God had made that provision to help poor people. And so Jesus sees this, and he didn't just see something getting violated, he understood and can you see the emotion that started to come out of him? How dare you? And Jesus drove them out. And Jesus in that moment not only became the person who understood the poor, but he became the defender of the poor. The defender of the poor. So to anyone who feels marginalized today and unseen by a busy and cruel and greedy world, Jesus is your defender. So find yourself in the story. Jesus lived in a poor family. So for anyone marginalized, he gets you and he defends you. How's that for a miracle at Christmas? Next, verse 25. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and he was devout. And he was waiting for the consolation, this, the, the encouragement of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was on Simeon. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Now, this Christmas story does not often get told. It happens after the shepherds. Jesus is there being dedicated. He's still a baby. He's brought to the temple. And there's this weird old guy named Simeon. And Simeon's been told by God a very weird thing. You don't get to die until the Messiah comes. Right? Like God had promised the Messiah. Right? Hundreds and hundreds. Of, I mean, if, if you go back to Genesis, when most people think the very first prophecy about the Messiah was made, it's thousands of years ago. And they've been waiting all this time for their rescue. And poor Simeon is told, you don't get to die until you see him. Simeon's got to have asked God back, and when's that going to be? We have no record of that. And how old did he get? Early church tradition says he got to 200 years old. Now, I don't know. It doesn't say that in the scripture. But the guy was old, okay? Okay. I've, I've got an old aunt, um, and she's wonderful, and her, her, it's Aunt Jo, and I've told, talked about Aunt Jo before, and she's like 94, okay? And when you get to know Aunt Jo and you talk to her, she will tell you, I pray almost daily that God will take me home. <laughs> and she's, she's had a great life, and she's surrounded by love, but man, you know, she's at a spot. She's like, you know, there's just, there's a lot of things that have gone wrong, Okay? And she's ready to be done, and she's ready for glory, and she knows where she's going. And sometimes you just get tired of life. And I wonder how tired Simeon was of life. But what was he doing? Is he was being a living parable. 
If you've studied the Old Testament prophets, you know that often God asked them to walk as a living parable. Not to tell a parable, but to be the parable. And Simeon represented for everybody around him the waiting people of God waiting for their Messiah. And the fact that God would be faithful. And so he's led by the Holy Spirit in this very, very special way. And he's taken into the temple. Look at verse 27. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. And when the parents, that's Mary and Joseph, brought in the child, Jesus, to do for him what the custom of the law required, that's the dedication, Simeon took him in his arms and he praised God. So Simeon gets there. He walks in the temple. An ordinary day, right? The Holy Spirit leads him there. And all of a sudden, he looks across the temple courts, and he sees Mary and Joseph holding a baby. And you've got to imagine the Holy Spirit whispering to him, that's the one. That's the one. And so he runs over to them, this crazy old man. Now, you've got to imagine this scene. And he scoops up the baby out of Mary's arms. And that's when she pepper sprays him. And Joseph tases him, you know? (laughs) Like, that's how it goes in my mind. Who are you and how did you just steal my baby? (laughs) You know, we've had a lot of babies at Grace Fellowship this year. A lot of babies. Church growth, amen? It's so good. But lots of babies, lots of wonderful babies, and babies are wonderful, are they not? And you parents that have had babies this year, God bless you and your sleep. <laughs> and it's, it's amazing, especially as you go into the holidays, how many people want to hold your baby and touch your baby, yes? And how many people have advice for you on parenting? And you try to smile and shake your head and... Like you're going through that experience. Can you imagine this being Mary? And this random old guy shows up and grabs your child. Again, you have to imagine the scene. What is it about babies we all love so much? Is it the smell? I think the smell is a big deal. How many of you are smell people today? Smell people? Yes. Soft skin? Yes. So tiny and innocent? Yes, like the eyes, the eyes are like, they just carry this silent innocence to them, don't they? And when they smile, it's like you've won the lottery. You can get a baby to smile. So, so good. We're all drawn in by babies. It's just, it's this common human experience that we have. Why would God come as a baby? Because babies are also total vulnerability. Aren't we drawn to that? A baby can't stop you from picking them up, can they? And a baby can't put on a seatbelt once you've picked them up. They can't comment about how they're being held. They can't protect themselves. They can't do anything. A baby is just innocent and vulnerable. I guess, take me. Right? Isn't it amazing? That's That vulnerability is part of what we just assume about babies. And God is not vulnerable. God is the all-powerful, invincible God. He made, he made the, the, the Milky Way galaxy and every other galaxy, yes? He's untouchable. And then God becomes a breakable baby. I mean, that, that should bake your noodle, right? <laughs> he becomes a breakable baby. And why does he do it? To show us that there's a vulnerability in him that he's offering to us. Because for an all-powerful God, he doesn't have to be vulnerable. So if he's going to be vulnerable, it's because he's choosing to. And when he came as a breakable baby, it wasn't just a physical hurtability. It was more. And he was trying to show us that it was more. Have you ever sat down with somebody that you really admire? And you sit down and you meet them for the very first time. Maybe you have coffee with them. And you're having a conversation. And, and, and when, you, when you first start to get to know that person, that person that you really admire, don't you feel super distant from them? Don't you feel like you can't measure up? You can't connect? You, you feel all those things. Until you go deeper into the conversation. And all of a sudden, that person shares a weakness of theirs or maybe a failure of theirs. And as soon as they do, you have this little smile on the inside and you get really excited and you lean forward because you know, this is a person who understands me. This is a person who's weak like me. This is a person that I can connect with. 
Like, it's hard to connect with Superman, isn't it? Like, he's super impressive. But he's hard to connect with. He's just too perfect. But God comes breakable. Do you see what he's doing with us today? God comes as a breakable baby in order to connect with us because we need that connection. How many of you are breakable today? Yeah, right? How many of us have brought in our mental health struggles to Christmas this season? How many of us have brought our broken family and broken marriage and broken children's struggles with us into Christmas? How many of us feel very, very breakable right now? And there's something about the Christmas season, isn't there, where we feel even more breakable than ever? So behold the breakable God who comes to connect with you. Isn't that encouraging? That he, would, that he would see us and want to be one of us like this. So find yourself in the story. You can connect with the vulnerable God who chose to be breakable just like you are. Last section. Verse 28, Simeon took Jesus in his arms and he praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. So the very first thing he says is, oh, I get to die now. Now, he doesn't die yet. That would be morbid, would it not? Be a difficult end to the story. I assume later it happened. Anyway, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation. This baby is your salvation. Wait, he's not even grown up yet. Does it need to be? Simeon knows. I've seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. Not only can he die now, but he, he, he notes the fact that he's the glory of Israel, but he's also the light to the Gentiles. And if you study the Old Testament, you know what a big deal this is, is that God had sent his light to the Jewish people. And there was a purpose in that. But he had always said that the Jewish people were supposed to share it with the rest of the world. And they had struggled to do so. And Jesus had come to correct that. It was going to go, his message, his salvation was going to be for all people. Amen? All people. Verse 33, the child's father and mother, they marveled at what was said about him. You would have marveled too. And then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother. Now, do you notice that? Simeon says this next part, not to them. He says it to Mary. And there's reasons for that. It says, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. And he says to Mary, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Some scholars believe that Joseph um, died sometime after Jesus was maybe 12. It's the last record we have of Joseph being present. And we have a lot of indications that Mary probably raised Jesus for a while as a single mom. By the time Jesus starts his adult ministry, it's definitely just Mary there. And she's depending on Jesus like the main income earner in the household. She's following him. So there's some things that Mary was going to go through that were going to be unique. Let's look at specifically what he says Three big phrases. Jesus will cause the rising and the falling of many. He will be a sign that's spoken against. And people's secret thoughts, and read there, their secret priorities, their fears, their hopes, all those things will be revealed by Jesus. So what's the rising and falling here? Now this is where this whole story gets really serious. If you felt like we were in a fluffy Christmas story up to this point... This is, this is where it gets some teeth. You ready for some teeth? That he would come and cause the rising and falling of many, of everyone. And Peter rose and Judas fell at Jesus. He was a watershed personality, a watershed person. You could not know Jesus without making a decision about Jesus. And to not make a decision was still making a decision. Amen? He would be the cause of the rising or the falling. It's only two options of many. 
and he would reveal their hearts because there's something about coming to Jesus that reveals your heart because in the decision, you say who you really are and what's really important to you. And Jesus had that divisive kind of a personality. There's a reason they were after him, yes? There's a reason that they opposed him. A lot of times we, we like to paint the picture of Jesus, especially at Christmas time. We like to paint the picture of Jesus as very, very meek and mild and happy all the time. Kind of like Mr. Rogers. And I love Mr. Rogers. But sometimes we like to paint Jesus as, as like this super nice, fluffy Mr. Rogers kind of a character. And gosh, if we knew him all today, man, we'd like him. But nobody ever killed Mr. Rogers. Yes? I know that's a weird thought. But also no one ever worshipped Mr. Rogers. There's something about Jesus that came as a king and came with demands. And you had to deal with the demands he was making on you. Always. Story after story after story after story. And a sword will pierce your own soul too, Mary. The rising or falling. Peter and Judas. Even the, the two criminals on the cross um, alongside of him. What a picture. One rises and the other falls. One accepts Jesus and the other one refuses him. Where are you at with Jesus? Here's your confrontational moment. Where are you at with Jesus? What has he demanded of you? And you're like, well, it's easy, and he's just a savior, and he just loves me. Yes, but he demands your surrender. And we've been talking about this last month right here at this church, that when Jesus comes, he does not ask you to earn any of your forgiveness with God. He doesn't. He paid for your forgiveness on the cross. That's the gospel. But he does require your surrender. Yeah. Surrender of what? Well, my self-reliance. I'd like to pull myself up by my own bootstraps, please. No, you don't get to. You're going to get saved and redeemed and forgiven, and you're going to give glory to someone else for all of eternity. That's the picture he demands. Well, I want to be my own master. You don't get to be your own master. I want my own truth. You don't get to have your own truth. I want my own version of happiness. You don't get your own version of happiness. When Jesus comes, Jesus comes as king. And all of a sudden, people rise or people fall in relation to him. We're having some Christmas reality right now. You're like, well, why would a sword pierce your own soul too? Because it's hard, isn't it? It's hard to give up the things that are so central to who we are. I mean, it should not shock us when a, when a psychiatrist has to go and dig up your old past in order for you to heal in the present. That's a painful process, yes? Or a surgeon has to cut you all open in order to remove the things that are killing you. Like that's the way that healing happens. And Jesus comes to a human soul and says, there's some things we've got to deal with. And there's going to be some cutting. It's hard. Um, a few, well, a month and a half ago maybe, uh, we got a puppy. The True Blood's got a puppy. Yeah, little puppy. Her name's Millie. And so <laughs> there she is. This is, this is Millie's very first sermon illustration, so she's officially one, a member of the family now. <laughs> right? Um, so she's, she's wonderful. She's the best dog. I don't care about your dog. She's the best dog. <laughs> she's the cutest dog. And uh, I'll just say, if you stare deep into her eyes, she will hypnotize you, and you will give her anything that she wants. <laughs> See? See? You'll give her anything she wants. She's like, wait, what do you want, Millie? What, what kind of treat do you want? Um, no, she's, she's really, really wonderful. Okay, so Lynn and I are putting up Christmas lights in the front yard, and we got little, wonderful Millie running around. And do you ever get those burrs in your yard? So she had stopped on one while she was running around. We didn't know. All of a sudden, puppies screaming. And we just shriveled into gelatin at that point because <laughs> she's so cute and... So anyway, so we grab her, we get her into the house. We're trying to figure out what's wrong. And 
we realize there's a burr stuck in her paw and all of this. And I go and grab metal tweezers, which you need, but that's very scary to a little puppy. And so she does not want the metal tweezers, yes? And she definitely doesn't want me coming toward her painful leg. But I have to. And she has to let me in there. And I have to remove the thing that's causing her pain. And as soon as I remove the thing that's causing her pain, it's all smiles and barks again. Yes? And everything's good again. We have a way of not trusting the Savior that comes to us and says, I need to remove the poison that's in your soul. All your self-reliance, all the demand to be your own king, all the demand for your own truth, all the demand for your own version of happiness, all your demands for all these things. I know it's so, it's so cultural. It's so who we are. But that's the stuff that's killing you. And so when Jesus comes, he asks us to surrender it all. And then he looks at Mary and he looks her in the eyes and don't miss this moment. He says, and a a sword will pierce your own soul too, Mary. Because he's just described how a sword's going to pierce every single person in humanity. But Mary realized it's going to happen to you too. And you're like, well, how could it happen to Mary? Mary's perfect Mary. So Mary... Mary saw all the miracles and she saw the angel and she saw all this evidence and she treasured it all up in her heart. But did you know she had her own struggles? Did you know Mary had her own moment? There's a, there's a spot and it's in the book of Mark, chapter 3, verse 21. If you want to look it up later, I'm not going to show it to you now. But Jesus has started his ministry and he's in a house and he's teaching and He's stirring things up and he's saying things that are controversial to people and he's already got people who are for him and against him and all this kind of stuff. And Mary shows up with his brothers and they stand outside and they say, you've got to go and get him and bring him to us so that we can take him home. He's lost his mind. And they literally say he's lost his mind. Our son's gone a little crazy. You're like, well, how can Mary say that? Okay, I'm ready for you to be the Messiah, Jesus, but some of these things that you've said, I'm not sure about that. Some of these things that you've done, some of these people that you frustrated, I'm just not sure about that. You can see a mama, and she begins to struggle. And I think my boy's lost his mind just a little bit. And this stumbling stone that her son has become, Mary herself stumbles on the, on the stumbling stone. And we don't know exactly how she figures it out. But later on in the text, she starts showing up and she starts traveling with Jesus and she's following Jesus. And all the way to the cross, she gets all the way to the cross and she's sitting there loving her son through the worst moment of his entire life. But don't forget that a sword pierced her own soul too. She went through her own struggle. And we don't know how she worked her way out of it, but she did, amen? I guess what I want to say to you is just because you've struggled with Jesus in the past doesn't mean you can't figure it out in the future. Doesn't mean you can't figure it out today. We all have those moments. There's more people who come to this church that grew up in the church and left the church and then came back to the church. That's most of the people that come here. We've almost all got that story. We almost all had a moment of stumbling. But Jesus has come with a sword to pierce your own soul too. So find yourself in the story. The child came to pierce your soul. And you're either rising or you're falling right now. Which is it? Heavy words. I want to pray for you. Would you guys stand? I want to pray for you. Did you find yourself in the story today? Yeah? Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for Christmas. And Jesus, you're the author of Christmas. And Jesus, we thank you, God, that the 
there's just so much richness, God, in the story. And we saw new richness today, God. And I thank you. What's, what's wonderful about it is that we get to see ourselves in it. And God, I pray, Lord, that you would help us see ourselves in it. And God, I want to say a special prayer, Lord, for those who are, they're deciding about Jesus. And God, I pray that you would give the blessing of faith. I pray that you give the blessing of surrender that we would let go. And I pray that you would give the blessing of trust that we would trust you in your hand. We love you, Jesus. In Christ's name, amen.